Cellular device. Handheld cell phone. How many of you have light post on that handheld cell phone? Have you checked in? My answer is, I don't know, did Miss Brandy check us in? <laughs> Sorry, just how that goes. Uh, check yourself in there to, to light post if you have not. That way we'll have a record of your attendance and a more accurate record uh, than usually what we have in our counting. So, if you will grab a Bible and turn to page number 930, if your Bible looks like this, if not, that'll be the book of Haggai, the book of Haggai, small little book there in the latter portion of the Old Testament. We're going to find ourselves in the book of Haggai this morning as we look at questions God will ask throughout the Old Testament. Now, please be aware, and most of you probably are, that we have not looked at every single question. Uh, we've looked at questions here and there, uh, but we have not looked at every single question, mainly because uh, that, that study of every single question would probably take us a hundred years. So, We've looked at questions here or there, and we're going to be in the book of Haggai this morning. Let's talk about the characteristics of God. We need three more characteristics of God uh, further down the road than where we have been. So, so three characteristics of God. Uh, if you haven't been here, some of the more... Um, Easy ones we have already done, like uh, loving and kind and gracious. So three more characteristics of God. What do you have? Fearsome. Fearsome. That's a good one. Hebrews chapter eleven, the la or chapter twelve, the last verse. Our God is a consuming fire. Sure, uh, there is a fear associated with being on the wrong side. Uh, of God. That's exactly right. Uh, we don't want to find ourselves there. That's a good one. Two more. You are almost there. Similar to dead is uh, wrath. Wrathful, sure. Uh, according to Romans chapter 2, that he is storing up wrath against the day of wrath. So he is uh, keeping a note of what we as humanity are doing and is going to repay those things uh, according to how we have lived. And so we don't want to find ourselves storing up wrath against the day of wrath. That's right. Those are two pretty good ones. What about your third one? What do you have? I'm sorry? Healer. Healer. That's a good one. How many times has God shown himself to heal uh, a people uh, through the miraculous or even a nation uh, through its repentance? I'm thinking there exclusively of Nineveh and in the book of Jonah. Uh, but you have a group of people who needed to be healed, and so God would take care of those things. Uh, it's interesting as you and I look through the characteristics of God as we start this particular study uh, that we can either get focused on a lot of those positive things or we can kind of get focused on a lot of those negative traits or as we would see those negative. Uh, but it's interesting as it rounds out who God is. John, uh, 1 John 4, 8 is true that God is love, but it's not complete. It's not everything God is. And so as we look at God and we understand God, understand that he's more than just love, even though, even though he is the perfect example of that. Page 930, book of Haggai. So when you and I open up this particular book, we find a group of people who have been in Babylonian captivity, and now they're coming back. But they're coming back to a, for lack of better terms, a wasteland, a, a, a place that has been 
uh, sort of decimated, a place that has been s- sort of leveled to what they did know. And it is in the book of Haggai where God sends them back to rebuild the temple. There were a few men before him who had to rebuild a couple of things. Can you think of those guys? I don't know is a good, that's, a, that's an all right answer. I don't know is all right. Somebody's going to have to say something. Nehemiah, he had to rebuild. He had to rebuild a wall. Ezra had to rebuild what? The law, right? Zerubbabel is the guy in charge. He's the governor. He's going to rebuild the government. And here you have Haggai and Zechariah working together as uh, companions here. And they are going to be in charge of rebuilding the temple. The temple's a very key uh, aspect in the Old Testament way of life. If you don't have the temple, then you're kind of stuck. Well, does that mean they couldn't have, couldn't have uh, worshipped God anywhere? Well, that's a um, yes and no answer. Could they have worshipped God anywhere? If you look in Matthew chapter 4, or rather John chapter 4, you'll see that woman at the well say, can't we just worship God here? To where Jesus would say there's coming a time where it doesn't matter where you are, where you can worship, so you can worship anywhere. There's coming a time, Jesus would say, and that would not be right where they are. So that means man can't worship God anywhere except for the temple, right? This is a trick question. Because then you have to ask the question, what about synagogues? And what about uh, Daniel and his friends? If they're over in Babylon, how do they get back to the temple for worship? And so it is within reason, if man is close to the temple or within a a certain amount of of, uh, distance, he goes to the temple. If he's further away than that, he worships in synagogues, those... um, what we would call satellite places to worship. All that is pretty well done in Babylon when Haggai comes on the scene. Haggai's job is to rebuild this temple that started with Solomon, started all the way back in uh, 1 Kings. David had an opportunity or, or wanted to have an opportunity really in 2 Samuel to build this temple. He, he even went to his own preacher, whose name was. He also preached a really powerful sermon that we would entitle, You're the Man. Nathan, there you go. Hey, are y'all awake today? All right, here we go. He goes to Nathan and says, I'd like to build a temple. And Nathan says, do, what, do what's in your heart. It sounds like a great thing. To which God comes back to Nathan and says, you tell him, I said, I don't want you to build me anything. Ooh, well, that seems kind of harsh from God, doesn't it? I don't want you to build me anything. Why not? Well, he's a man with blood on his hands. From war? Yeah, a little bit. From other things in life? Yeah. Well, Solomon ain't much better, but Solomon is the one who's chosen. And he begins a task of building a temple. And interestingly, history will tell us He sends a set of blueprints up the shoreline to a place called Lebanon. King, uh, whatever his name is, King somebody of Tyre and Sidon, King, uh, anywho, he takes those blueprints and he starts manufacturing walls and starts manufacturing logs and these kinds of things interestingly and starts floating them down the edge of the Mediterranean Sea and they begin to be picked up and pulled across and here we start the ideas of this this temple that's going to be built. Herod's going to come in and sort of blow it up and, and make it much bigger and throughout the years it's going to have about three different facelifts 
But it's going to stay relatively where it is, but it's going to get bigger and grander and more of an attraction for everybody to come and see. But all of that starts here, the second version of the temple. After Solomon's temple is destroyed, Haggai is sent back with a few others to rebuild this temple. And here's what we read. Chapter 1, verse number 1. Second year of King Darius, sixth month, first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai by Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Josek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, My time is not come, the time when the Lord's house should be built. This is going to give us an insight to what's going on. Here's, here's the buzz around town. It's not just time yet. It's not just time yet for us to build the house of the Lord. It was never God's expectation that the people of Israel would come back to where they were here in, ha in Haggai, in Israel, and start immediately the very next day on the temple. It was never the expectation of God for that. Do you know why that is? Reuben, do you know what the three most important things for uh, survival are? In order, water, then food, then shelter. They need a house. They got to live somewhere too, right? So the, the first portion of this idea is they're first going to make sure the wells are working right, right? Shake your head this way. If you don't, you don't have very long. They're going to make sure their food sources are right. If not, you don't live very long. The next thing they're going to look at is the shelter they're going to live in and make sure that they have uh, at least some kind of way to protect themselves from the weather, right? And so they're going to make sure those things are all right. Then they're going to start working on the task for which God sent them. God didn't expect them to start that straight out, but he did expect them to start it. Now, when you and I move to verse 3, what God has says about them, or 3 and 4, he says through the mouth of this prophet Haggai. He says by Haggai to them, uh, verse 4, Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie in waste? There's a difference between having a house and constantly renovating a house, isn't there? How many of you would love to live in a renovation? All right, it's unanimous. How many of you would like to live in a house that is renovated and just completely renovated and you don't have to see the guys? Yeah, well, Israel's living in a state of renovation. This house that I'm living in is enough to keep me warm and dry and sheltered out of the, out of the rain and, and keep the wild animals off of me. But I think I'd like a streaming service to go in there. I think I'd like some recessed lighting and maybe a, a I don't know, whatever else sounds really good. We need to make a bigger bath, you know, bathrooms, kitchens, cell houses. And so before we can work on the temple, we need to get Miss, Mrs. Haggai a soaking tub. This is what they're doing. They are pushing, putting finishing touches and extra finishing touches on their houses before getting to the task. Now, stop before you say, Billy said you ought not have a finished house. That's not what Billy said. What the Lord said through Haggai to these people are, are you ever going to start doing what I asked you to do? Is it ever going to be enough with your house so you can get started on, on my house? Is there a bigger 
task to be done by these people other than making sure their houses are all right? That's the question. That's it. That's, that is Haggai's question. Is, is there... Is the task God sent them to Israel to do, is it in any way bigger than what their minds are set on? For the people who are there, they say no. Why? Because, well, because their Netflix aren't coming in just like they want it to. Because their, their uh, garage door isn't opening and closing when they mash that button. Ours doesn't either. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, check the motherboard. That's how that starts. You can replace those pretty easily, so they tell me. The problem is, you know the old saying, they can't see the forest for the trees? That's where they are. They, they, they refuse to, to look up from where they are in their housing to look up and see that the Lord's house, the, the task they were given by God, has yet to be done. Now, when we think about them in that situation, we think, I don't know why. I don't know why they wouldn't go ahead and get started. Oh, Jonathan, by the way, I found a little sock that looks like a, a brown lion over in the uh, multipurpose building. Make sure Miss April sees that. You, it just reminded me when I saw you to tell you that. So, sorry about this. Well, welcome to my world. You know, when, they, when they're looking at their houses... And they're, they're so consumed with those things, and yet they, they can't see what God has sent them for. Is there not something bigger that they need to do? Let's, let's look at that question as, as us. We've not, we've not been tasked with building a temple. Let's just be honest like that. We've not been tasked that way. We've not been tasked with moving out of captivity into a, a place of freedom and building our houses and making sure our families are okay and then building a temple. We've not been tasked with that. But what the church has been tasked with is building the kingdom. And sometimes we get very happy where we are and forget about the task that the church has been tasked with. Sometimes we look at uh, how well things are going, whether it be uh, numerically or financially or with our young folks or with our older folks, and we say we got it pretty good. And the fact is, we do. But what we have failed to do is really look outside those doors at a group of people known by the world as Hot Springs, Arkansas, and find out that most people there don't know anything about Jesus aside from the fact that we think he's the Son of God. And that's not... That's not, what, that's not going to save them. That's not going to be where they need to be. Is that where they need to start? Probably. But that ain't where they need to end up. A mental assent to who Jesus the Christ is or who he claimed that he was is not where you and I need to end. If, if all we do is think I got a pretty good inclination that Jesus was the Son of God. And He is never the Lord of my life. I, I don't really have anything. Here you have a group of people who are taking care of their needs. And that's a good thing. And they're letting the needs of the kingdom, letting the needs of the temple, sort of hang on to the side. So when God asks this question through Haggai in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 4, 
does it seem like they have a timetable in which they're going to start? Look at the question again in verse number four. How long, how long does it take? How long does it take to build a house? You ready for this? Write this down. This is going to be a direct quote. This is how long it takes to build a house. 30 minutes, right? Maybe an hour if you're watching a long show, right? They go from dirt all the way to let's have a big reveal in 30 minutes or an hour, right? That's how long it takes. Come on, man. It takes six months? Okay. Let's say it's six months. Is that, is that are we close? A year? About a year. I would say I want to build a big one. Y'all know what big one is? That's an Alabama term. Uh, a big one. Uh, and let's say I want it to, to last, and it lasts me 19 months. Am I exempt in that 19 months from following God's will? Oh, it got real quiet in here now. Shake or nod. Am I exempt from following God's will in those 19 months? No, but this, this is the lifestyle in which the children of Israel lived during Haggai's day. Well, we've got so much to do around our houses. Well, they do. Could they? Let's say they're Americans. Could they work for six hours at the temple and six hours at home? Well, at least you have something going, right? Here you have the temple kind of started and stopped. By the way, some historians will say it took about 13 and a half some historians will say up to 15 and a half years. So you just pick whichever in that, in that little ballpark, whichever one you want. It doesn't really matter. It's how long it would take them to rebuild this temple. I wonder why. Notice how, how this, this goes on here. Here's what God says. Verse 4, it's time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie in waste. God would say here, and I know it's not a question, but it is an interesting statement that he mentions twice in this chapter and nowhere else in the Bible. Here's the phrase. Consider your ways. Hmm. Or if he were from 2000. 24 in Hot Springs via Munford, Alabama, he would say, what are you doing? Think about what you're doing and why you're doing those things in that way. Did you know that most of the issues that happen around the Hayes household is due to tone and not content? Oh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of seating up here. Mm -hmm. You get in trouble for tone and not content. It's not what you said. It's the way you said that. Interestingly, God is saying this. It's not the work that you're doing as much as it is the work that you're not doing. Not that he's condemning what they are doing. What he's condemning is the fact that they are not doing the other. Consider your ways. What are you doing in those things? And then why are you doing them in that way? Is it, let, let's, let's go ahead and answer the question. Is it okay that they have houses? This one's easy. There's only one right answer, and it's yes. It's okay they have houses. Is it okay that they have houses to the expense of God's house? No. Consider your ways, he says, verse number four. 
you have planted gardens, and those gardens have produced, or, or, or you have, have large gardens that look like they would pre, be producing a lot of things. But yet when you gather them, there's not much there. Hello? What's he trying to tell you? Oh, well, preacher, you know, sometimes gardens don't work. I understand that. I understand that. But here you have a group of people who have been living underneath the blessing of God, and those blessings go away, and they are very much in tune with that, and they, yet, they have yet in this garden aspect to see what God's trying to say. Look at verse number 6. Oh, you eat, you eat every day, but when you go to bed, you still have the idea of, man, if I had just a few handfuls of crackers and cheese, it'd be just fine. You still have just a little pain left in your stomach. You eat, but you're never full. Verse number six you have water, you have things to drink, but your throat's always dry. You wish you could get one more drink. Oh, you have some clothes. You have clothes, but it's never enough to keep you... It's never enough to keep you exactly warm. You're not exactly cold, but you're not exactly warm either. Notice verse 6 here. And then as you go through your day, you are making money and you're putting it in a billfold that has holes in it. Let me move this strap for a second. And it looks like this. And you say, where did all my money go? Let me pick up these few little dead presidents right here. God's blessing you with food and with water and with clothes and with money. And yet it's not enough. And you're not seeing it. This is the same God who, while they were in the wilderness, provided for them something called manna, which was collected daily. As much as they wanted to eat, collected daily. And on day number six, or yeah, day number six, they would collect twice as much that day so that they could have some for day six and the Sabbath. But if they collected more than they needed the, the day of, then it would, it would rot and get worms. And he provided everything that they needed. He would provide them with clothes that didn't wear out. He would provide them with water from rocks. From rocks. He provided for them everything that they needed. And yet now when they need something, they're just short. They're, they're coming up just short. And they think, well, God certainly changed since we went into captivity. You think? You think it is the fact that God has changed? No, it's not that fact. It's the fact that priorities, as we say, are out of whack. Or not in whack, I guess. Would be. They're not in line. And he would say at the beginning, verse 5, consider your ways. And as he would make these compelling points about their clothing and about their food and about their, their housing situation, he would end that particular statement with verse number 7 where he would once again implore them, consider what you're doing, how you're doing it. Because 
What you're doing is not wrong. But how you're doing it might very well be. And so he asks them to consider their ways. Then turn over to chapter 2. Chapter 1, they start rebuilding this temple and they go, oh, okay, we get it. So in chapter 2, here's what you'll read in the seventh month. In the first and twenty day of that month, the word of the Lord came to prophet Haggai. By the way, when you're reading through the Old Testament, especially through the uh, minor prophets, the last twelve books of the Old Testament, you're going to read a very common phrase that, that pops itself up there in this particular book time and time and time again. And that phrase is, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet whomever. This phrase is a phrase that would help us to understand and lead us back to the idea of inspiration. The prophet's not just saying this, that y'all need to be working this way because that's what God said. No, this is an inspired statement, an inspired uh, directive given by God through this man. And so he's not just coming up with it. This man is inspired of God. So here's the inspiration of God. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Let's start right there for a moment. Let's start with the phrase, residue of the people. Anybody not reading from the older King James Version that might have a different phrase than residue? Remnant, that's probably a better idea. Remnant is probably a better idea. Here are a group of people who are left. It's not the same amount of people who went into captivity. These are the people who are left. Some did not come back from captivity. You'd say, well, why not? Well, ask Esther. She didn't come back. Ask Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. They died over there. Now, I'm going to give you something here, and this is opinion, and you take it for whatever you want to, or leave it here. Those righteous that are left, I think, are there to prepare the minds and the hearts of those Gentile nations to be influenced by the gospel way on down the road, I think. Now, you can take that or leave that. But that's what I think. So, his question is, to those, re those remnant of people, those few people who came back, not everybody came back, is this. Who among you saw the temple in its heyday, in its glory? When, when Solomon made this temple in its beauty, before it was destroyed about 70 years ago, how many of you saw it? Now, the implication by God is this. There are some folks in this crowd who fit that bill, correct? Yeah, why? Because God is, is making a point here. He's not saying, boy, I, is there anybody here who ever saw it? God knows everything, right? Somebody's going to have to shake or not on that one. There you go. God knows everything. So he's not asking the question for information. He's asking it for contemplation. And so, how many of y'all saw it? And here in the back, maybe stooped down a little bit, Maybe not as strong as they were 70 years ago. Is a group of men and possibly women. A little more gray in their hair. A little more life underneath their belt. 
And they raised their hands. Who of you saw it? We saw it. We saw it. We saw a structure that was 75 feet wide by 150 feet long. We saw a structure that was really divided into three parts, but not three equal parts. We saw a structure that was surrounded by a, a fenced wall. We saw a magnificent structure that when you walked up to it, you saw a, a golden, a brazen uh, uh, altar that would be more than head high. By the way, that's a big old altar. And have a ramp up to it. Interestingly, side note for you, God takes care of a lot of things. That's why the high priest wore britches, linen britches. So when he's up there making sacrifice, you don't look up his skirt because you're watching the sacrifice and you go, oh, whoa, whoa. God's going to take care of that. He already had that in the plan. It's not like he went, well, we're going to have to do something with that. He already had that. You're going to see a place that's going to smell like iron and, and other sorts of minerals due to the amount of blood that was shed on the ground there. You're never going to get rid of that smell. It's going to smell like burnt hair and eventually burnt beef or burnt goat. I don't know if beef is cow. Is there a special word for meat for goat or is it just goat? It's going to smell like burned up goats. It's going to smell like burned up uh, turtle doves. It's going to smell like burned up cows. There's going to be a pile of ashes over here to the side. And that pile of ashes are going to be the ashes of a red heifer. And at times when people need to, to be ceremonially clean, they're going to come get a scoop of those ashes and put it into water, and that's going to be how they clean themselves. Well, that ain't clean water. Well, that's what God said to do. So take it up with him. They're going to move from that particular place and all those sights and smells, and they're going to move into this little room. It's going to be on the front side of this, or this uh, uh, temple. You're going to be in the court of the women and then the Gentiles. Now, I didn't divide this this way. So I don't leave class saying Billy hates girls and Gentiles. That ain't what I'm saying. But there is a division. And within, within this court area, uh, you have certain things that sort of line the walls. You're going to have a, a, a table of, of showbread, an interesting little table there that David would have accessed after he killed Goliath while he was on the run. You know, that's the place, the temple here is the place where David left that sword that he cut Goliath's head off with. Y'all remember that? He stood on his chest. That's a good part of the story. We don't ever hear that part. Oh, he just knocked him down with a rock. He cut his head off with his own sword. That's pretty big too. By the way, how many rocks did David have? How many? Five. Anybody know why? Just a side note here. Do you know Goliath had four brothers? Just put that in your little, in your little brain and chew on it for a week or two and tell me what you think about it. You think God can't hit all five of them with a rock? Mm -hmm. Anyway, you have the court, uh, you have the uh, table of showbread that's here, and you have, uh, you have this weird looking candlestick. By any of you guys, uh, when it comes around Christmas time in our nation, and you'll see uh, Hanukkah things and all those kinds of things during that time, do you know what a menorah is? You got that shape in your mind? Somebody shake or nod. All right, then you know what the candlestick looks like. That's what it looks like. How'd they get that shape? That's, mm -hmm. that's how they got it. They have all these different 
uh, things that are found within this court of the Gentiles and the women. And this is what we would, what we would associate with our foyer area in our building. It was in there, but not really in there, you know? And so you go through another curtain area, and you come into what would, we would call our, our main auditorium area. And this is where the, the men, the Jewish men, would gather, and they would show themselves to be Jewish men uh, to get into this, um, into this area to worship God. And there's really a couple of ways to do that. Jewish men look different, uh, not like Jonathan. Jonathan has a beard that is trimmed up and nice and curved to his face. Where's Lessel when you need him? Or Derek when you need him? Not the Jewish man. The Jewish man has a beard that's starting to look more like Reuben's beard. It's, it's just long. It was, it was never designed to be cut and rounded on the corners. It was just designed to just, here we go, it's growing, here it is. I think of uh, the Oak Ridge Boys. You know that guy? Who's, you know the guy. What's the guy's name? I don't even know the guy's name. You know, he has white hair now. He has a long a white beard. Um, welcome to it. I don't know his name. You know who I'm talking about. The older they get, the longer it gets, all that kind of thing. Well, you can fake that. Well, maybe Reuben and Jonathan could fake that. I cannot. Will can probably fake that. You, if you can grow that beard, you can look like a Jewish man, kind of. I can't grow that beard. So, you had to prove yourself to be a Jewish male. And you can do that one of two ways. When you are circumcised at day eight, you get what we call a birth certificate. But this is a, another kind of certificate. And you would show that. And this would prove that you have um, been Jewish and have followed all of the protocol God would have, and you have the right to go into this auditorium. You can also prove that if you don't have that paper. And that was a task of one of the, of the priests. I'm imagining he's very low on the totem pole, and you want to get away from that particular job as quickly as you can. But in that auditorium, Jewish men. And then there's a curtain right back here that nobody goes into. And nobody sees, nobody has anything to do with that except for one guy in the entire nation. He gets to go back there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. After he's made sacrifice for himself and his family, after he finds himself pure with God, he immediately goes from that sacrifice to this sacrifice. And here's what I think. You can think what you want, but here's what I think. You don't have time from finding yourselves being holy and righteous before God to moving to this sacrifice to mess up and do something stupid. And so you walk into that particular place Righteous and holy before God. Completely clean. This high priest. And he makes sacrifices behind that curtain. Onto a box. It's not very big. Has a couple of angels outstretched on it. This thing called the mercy seat. Right in between these two angels. Uh, Jesus would say, or John would say about Jesus uh, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2, 1 and 2 that Jesus is this propitiation now. Uh, in the Hebrew, it would be translated as, is the mercy seat now. And the question for this group in Haggai chapter 2 is, how many of you saw that? With all the, the pomp and the, the circumstance that were around all of those things, how many of you can still smell what that, that outer court smelled like? How many of you can see what that menorah, that candlestick looks like in the, the table of showbread there? How many of you remember that priest who goes in, history would tell us, he goes in with a, with a rope tied around one of his legs. 
There's no, I don't believe that. There's no way that's the truth. And here's why history will tell us that. If he goes in there and he's not righteous before God, he'll die in there. That high priest will die in there. And as morbid as a, of a thought as it is, somebody's got to retrieve the body. And they'll drag him out. How many of you remember that? How many of you remember seeing those things and those, those older hands grow up, go up? And then he asked this question, how do you see it now? Hmm. All right, older people, let me ask you this. How many of you remember those two-week meetings? How many of you remember those old uh, church buildings that had windows that would open up during the summertime? And that people would be at those meetings and on the porch and by the windows trying to hear? How many of you remember when kids during those meetings, were relegated to sitting on the steps of the, of the stage area so adults could sit down. Many of you remember when those older men and women of those congregations would pass away, and not only would the church gather in that church building and press forward, but also those who were affected outside in the community. Who remembers when you could have a civil discussion about religion outside of the walls of the church building and people would even at times disagree but still walk away as friends and even some people would disagree and go to studying and thinking and say, I'm going to prove this guy wrong only to prove the Bible right. How many of you remember when People used to sing without songbooks or PowerPoint. Sheet charts. You remember sheet charts? How many of you remember that? What do you think now? How many, how many of you remember numbers before COVID? <laughs> or the way to church used to operate before COVID. What do you think now? How many of you remember when you would invite a neighbor or a friend from your community to church services and they'd come with you and they would tell you at that time they're coming with you and then they would show up? What about now? We tend to look at how things were in the past and use this particular phrase. Man, those were the good old days. Well, what was so good about them? People were still lost. People were still invited. Some would come, some would not. People would still either decide to follow God or not. There's not, nothing good that way. It still happens that way today. There's nothing really important about the days. So basically all we have is old there. Maybe our rememberer is not as good as our forgetter at times on things that were not as great in the good old days. Well, when Haggai asked these people, do you remember what it used to look like? And what do you think about it now? You don't have a lot of people answering with a lot of flaws. Well, it ain't like it used to be. It doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. It has all of those things. What's missing in this temple that used to be there? Come on, this one's a softball. This one's easy. What's missing in the temple that used to be there? Starts in, it starts with an F, ends with an oaks. 
folks? Where are the people? Where did they go? Well, some stayed back there, yep. Some died, yep. The task for them now in this new renovated temple is to fill it. And they can't fill it being worried about their house. And they can't fill it being worried about the past. They're going to have to fill it being worried about the future. That's a good lesson for us, isn't it? Where's everybody? we got to fill it. Why? Because we're concerned about the future. I remember how it was in the past, sure. I remember how it was, uh, you know, when we were building this and working on that. I remember those things, yes. But am I concerned about the future of God's church? Well, all right, that's all the time we have for Haggai. If there are any questions you have,